Hi there, I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back to more Conversations in the Digital Age. The subject of the hour is ISIS, the Islamic State that's dominating the news these days. President Obama has referred to ISIS at times as ISIL, or the junior varsity of Al-Qaeda, or a bunch of thugs and killers engaged in a cult of death. Hillary Clinton refers to them as ISIS, or radical jihadists, while Republican frontrunners Ted Cruz and Donald Trump say that terrorism won't be stopped until Obama and the Democrats use the words radical Islamic terrorism. Does it really matter? Whatever the name, what is to be done about the Islamic State? Ignore them? Intervene with troops? Send drones? Or do nothing? For the answer and the way forward, we have with us, and we are very fortunate to have with us, Bernard Haeckel. Bernard Haeckel is a professor of Near Eastern Studies at Princeton. He's been called the nation's foremost secular authority on the Islamic State and has been an advisor to the CIA, the Department of State, and the Armed Forces on Islamic terrorism. Professor Haeckel, we're delighted to welcome you to the program. Now, the West's response to ISIS, it's an issue in the campaign. Has it been robust enough, in your view? Well, my feeling is that President Obama has made a prudential uh, decision not to associate the word Islam with um, this group. And presumably that's because he doesn't want to associate most Muslims who disagree and are not with this group uh, with them. He doesn't want to lump them all together and hopes to have most Muslims side against them. Um, I think that's a legitimate call as a p for a politician to make. Um, w whether he's doing a good job, I also think actually it's a rather good job uh, that he's performing in that he is using local forces, mainly Shiites and Kurds, with uh, special uh, American forces and spotters on the ground. This is in uh, Iraq. In Iraq and in, and in Syria. Um, and trying to take out, um, you know, ISIS uh, fighters and command centers and so on. And I think they've lost 30 to 40 percent of their territory in Iraq and Syria in the last year. Um, this is not a movement that can be just defeated militarily and it's, and, and it's over. There's much more to this movement than just military defeat, frankly. Well, the Republican candidates take another approach. Uh, Cruz says he wants carpet bombing of Syria, which our general over there, General McFarland, says is contrary to our values and how we wage war. Uh, carpet bombings, random bombing throughout the country. Uh, Donald Trump says we have to uh, pursue ISIS until they're utterly defeated. Now, do uh, you agree that either of those uh, approaches are going to uh, get us anywhere? Well, I don't, I don't think that, uh, you know, if, if what by pursue ISIS, uh, Donald Trump means that we should send troops there, I mean, massive numbers of troops, I don't think that's a recipe for uh, a solution to the problem. I mean, we've already invaded Iraq in the past and left it a mess. In fact, ISIS is in part a product of that failed invasion and occupation of Iraq. So, you know, the problem with you know, the military, the purely military solution to this problem is what do you do after you defeat them? Who runs the, that territory? Who will manage these people? And we're talking about millions of people. And ultimately, it actually doesn't understand uh, what produces ISIS, which are really deep structural problems in the region that are partly to do with the United States, but also largely to do with local dynamics. You know, you have a tradition of authoritarian brutality by local regimes, local governments that is now many decades in the making. You have no civil society. You have a massive youth bulge. You have economic, uh, uh, lack of economic opportunity. You have the rise of an Islamic political movement from the 1970s onwards. I mean, there are many factors that are leading to, the, to what we call ISIS, which is a, f a phenomenon or a symptom of the disenfranchisement of many Sunni Arabs, the so feeling of being disenfranchised. They mainly uh, come to power where there is a weak state structure. Is that right? 
Or even when there is a strong state, like the Iraqi state was not a weak state, and they smashed it in the Sunni areas and were able to take over those territories. And that was in the case of Iraq, because the Iraqi state was a sectarian state led by Prime Minister Maliki, a man that the United States helped bring to power. And he was a sectarian Shiite who was discriminating and persecuting Sunnis and actually drove the Sunnis into the arms of ISIS. Um, now, uh, another formula that has been floated is we should assemble a coalition. Yes. Uh, now, so that we won't be perceived, the U.S. won't be perceived to have spearheaded the attack on, uh, yeah. uh, on Muslims. Um, do you think we'll have any success getting Gulf states and Saudis to join a coalition against ISIS? Well, in effect, there is a coalition that it does include the Saudis and the uh, United Arab Emirates and Qatar. And at the very beginning of the bombing campaign, the aerial bombing campaign, they did get involved briefly. Um, this coalition, though, effectively also includes Iran, because Iran is fighting ISIS through, through the Iraqis and also in Syria through uh, proxies and, and non-state actors like Hezbollah. Um, the thing is, though, if you look at the if you look at ISIS from the perspective of regional actors, let's say let's take the perspective of the Saudis first, and then we'll look at Turkey. For the Saudis, ISIS is an enemy, but it's not the t the number one enemy. The number one enemy is Iran. They want to see Iran defeated and its power rolled back from Lebanon, Syria, and Iraq. Um, ISIS is sort of. A, something they will deal with once Iran is dealt with first. From the Turkish perspective, that of Turkey, the number one enemy are the Kurds, who have irredentist ideas about creating their own state. 20% of Turkey is Kurdish. The, Kurd the Turks are very worried of, secess of se of se secessionist movement amongst the Kurds. So for them, ISIS is perhaps an enemy, but it's not as big an enemy as the Kurds. So the priorities of the local regional actors, including Iran, uh, are not the same as ours. Well, certainly at the moment in Syria, we don't have anyone uh, joining in our bombing missions or right. uh, our activities on the ground, uh, uh, certainly not from uh, any of the Gulf states and certainly not from Saudi, maybe. Uh, right. Uh, whatever act activity there was on the part of the Saudis is now kind of disappeared. That's right. And we aren't getting much support from uh, the Western nations either, are we? Not much. And the Saudis uh, have moved into another theater of operations, which is Yemen. But look, the way to think about ISIS, and one has to be very clear-headed about this, is that does it really pose an existential threat to the West or to the United States? It does not. Okay? Does not. It does not. I mean, it is a menace first and foremost to the region and to the peoples of the region. Now, in the region, we have strategic interests. The United States does. Those strategic interests are what we should defend and protect, not whether ISIS is in control of territory in you know, a desert in western Iraq or eastern Syria, where we don't have any strategic interest. Now, if ISIS was to come down and take over the oil fields of Saudi Arabia or Qatar or the UAE or Kuwait, I think a strategic interest or a red line would have been crossed. That, for that, we would go to war to protect those uh, assets and, because the global economy depends on the steady and reliable flow of that oil. Or if they, if they were attacked just attacked Israel or Jordan. Yeah, or Jordan or Israel would be another case, for instance. If they were even to attack Turkey, that would be another instance. But if they're in the middle of, you know, no man's land, which is effectively the territory that they control, I think being smart about it is probably the, the better way to go. And being smart about it is what Obama, President Obama is doing, which is basically to use a combination of air power and local forces on the ground to make them slowly but surely lose territory. Because there is nothing like loss and defeat to make ISIS look like losers and to diminish the pipeline of recruits. Well, there are two uh, ways that they are a threat, uh, aren't there? I mean, one is that if they're driving Syrians out of the country, refugees, and, right. and sending them over to Europe, which right. is a tremendous burden on European countries and affects right. the European economy, right. uh, well, that this would is affect our strategic interests. In, well, this is in part... I mean, it's not entirely true that they're creating the refugee problem. The Syrian refugee problem, which involves effectively 11 million Syrians, half the population being displaced, that population is largely being made into refugees by the Syrian re Assad regime, the government regime. And the Alawites. Uh, and the Alawites who are represented by the Assad regime. So if one wants to look at the refugee problem 
again, in a clear-headed way, one has to actually find fault with the Assad regime that has killed 300,000 people now, as of this date. 300 or 400,000 have disappeared, assumed dead. So we're talking about six or 700,000 dead and 11 million displaced. It's not really ISIS. ISIS, in fact, does not want its people to leave. It doesn't permit you to leave its territory. So the refugees are not from ISIS land. Well, the, but the ones that stay are being executed. So there's a, a, not all of them. Not if you're all Sunni, them. if you're Sunni and they have nothing against you, you're taxed, and you know you you have to perform a certain way of life. Support with, the war effort. Support the war effort, but you also have to pray five times a day. You're not allowed to smoke. Your your women are supposed to dress a certain way. I mean, there are all kinds of rules and regulations for how to live in their territory. But pushing you out is not is not one of their tactics, and it it actually is almost. It's very difficult to leave. They but normally you tax you. To if leave. you don't see the religion quite the same way, uh, right? Well, then it's they, too bad. You're an infidel, and it's too bad for you. That's so right. You do have an incentive to leave. Uh, 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 well, uh, leave I think for your life. Well, I mean, if you feel that strongly about it, but I think most people just basically put up with it, especially if they bring law and order, which they did bring compared to what was there before. I mean, now the air campaign has changed things dramatically. But if you spoke to a lot of Sunnis who are from Raqqa. When the ISIS first came and took over, they actually, you know, felt that, well, at least we don't have these marauding militias who had turned this entire region into a, you know, a, a mad world with chaos and, you know, wanton robbery and, 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 uh, and uh, rape of women. How many people do they control in Iraq and Syria? About eight million. And uh, how many fighters? It's hard to say. Some, uh, the, the highest number I've seen is 100,000. I suspect it's probably closer to 40,000. Now, uh, Secretary uh, Kerry said uh, that uh, we've really managed to degrade them in Iraq and Syria, yep. but he said most recently that they're entering in Libya uh, and posing a threat there. That's right. The, actually, there are a number of existing Islamic groups in different countries around the world. This includes Pakistan and Afghanistan, Libya, Nigeria, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, in certain countries like Mali and Niger, where existing Islamist groups have rallied to the ISIS flag. In other words, they've given their allegiance to ISIS and adopted ISIS's uh, you know, uh, identity and, and created what they call emirates, sort of mini-statelets in these territories. But they're not properly ISIS in the sense that they're not groups that were created and, and sent from the core territory and sent out. Libya is perhaps the one exception. Those connections are very strong. And they have to do with certain leaders of ISIS having spent time in Libya before the Arab Spring events. And uh, in Libya, they, uh, the elements sympathetic to ISIS have bought into uh, the jihadi uh, what Obama calls cult, uh, in that they're willing to engage in violence and uh, horrific yeah. executions. and Not just, I mean, the largest number of recruits, it seems, uh, to ISIS in the Arab world come from, uh, as a percentage of the population, come from Tunisia, which is, you know, a country that has been for a long time very secular, um, very educated compared to other Arab countries, very homogeneous, more or less middle class. So there are, there are things about the recruitment patterns to ISIS and to people who join that ideology that are very difficult to understand. There is no psychological profile or socioeconomic profile for the typical recruit. You have rich people, poor people, you have educated, uneducated men, women, Westerners, non-Westerners, converts. It seems to attract a whole kind of from the outside, a whole number of, of people that are very difficult to pin down in terms of, in terms of you know, sociopolitical or identity, or even psychological identity. Well, part of the uh, what's-in-a-name debate that we're seeing in the political campaign is that uh, the Republicans say we will never be able to defeat them unless and until Obama is willing to call them Islamic terrorists. Now, is ISIS Islamic? Where do they get the theology from if it's not Islam? Right. So, I mean, if you call them ISIS, uh, ISIS stands for the Islamic State in, 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 uh, in Syria and Iraq. Okay. Uh, so, um, you know, clearly Islam is part of who they say they are. And if you look at their ideology and you look at their theology, they do draw on a very specific tendency in Islamic 
theology and law, which historically has been minoritarian, was not a kind of major way in which Muslims understood their religion. They, they have a, a particular genealogy that is, again, a minority view, but a very powerful view because they're strict constructionists. They're people who are literalists in their approach to texts. And they also cherry pick those texts to highlight and sanctify violence over tolerance. Okay? Now, most ordinary Muslims... That is jihad. Yeah, they sanctify violence and jihad, armed struggle. Jihad just basically means armed struggle. And it's of two kinds. You have offensive and defensive. So is the literal text, uh, we talked about uh, the literalism of the Koran, does the literal text uh, proclaim uh, armed struggle? Is that part of what uh, God gave to the angel Gabriel who gave it to the prophet? Well, the Koran has quite a bit to say about warfare and about armed struggle. Uh, and but it also has con it sets conditions and ter and 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 provides a context for that for that law, and also it's very important to know that when we talk about Islamic law, we're not just talking about the Quran. We're talking about the traditions of the Prophet. These are many many thousands, tens of thousands of sayings that the Prophet uh, of of Islam said or did his deeds or his sayings. Then you have. 1400 years of Islamic legal interpretation and commentary on these two texts, plus consensus over certain issues uh, that are f now f fixed in Islamic law. So, you know, it's a very complex and rich legal tradition. ISIS does not appreciate nor does it invoke that complexity. It wants to short circuit the tradition, go back to the core text, and interpret them literally and typically without the context without the context either of the historical interpretation or even sometimes of the context of the time in which they, uh, these texts appeared and for what purposes. So they use these texts very instrumentally for their own political purposes today. So are they Islamic? Yes, they're Islamic. But they draw on a very particular and cherry-picked version of Islam. So let's look at um, uh, another place where uh, they may represent a strategic threat to the United States, and that's terrorism, right. either sponsoring terrorism, right. exporting terrorists to Western countries or to the United States, right. or, and then we have these homegrown sleeper agent terrorists such as San Bernardino or ISIS inspired, they said. Right. Um, so uh, isn't that a threat? Well, that was a threat before ISIS uh, came into being and created what is called the Caliphate in Iraq and Syria. So, you know, the idea that we have had to live with terrorism, you know, after all, what was 9-11, if not a major, the most important terrorist attack on this country? It was not ISIS, it was Al-Qaeda that did that. And we've had many lone wolf attacks since 9-11. Um, I think the way to think about terrorism is that it's just going to be there. It's a fact of life. And it's, again, not an existential threat to the United States. That someone should take out a knife or take out a gun and kill however many people is tragic. But it's not going to bring the United States down. Um, I think the metric is that uh, more people uh, were killed in accidental uh, toddler firing of, uh, of handguns in yeah. the last year than were killed in terrorist attacks by ISIS. Well, I mean, certainly we lose many more people in car accidents or all kinds of accidents than, than, than all terror attacks combined. But having said that, what worries me when it comes to the terror threat is the overreaction of the United States. So 9-11 is a good example of this. So, you know, bin Laden and, and al-Qaeda are said to have spent about 500000 on the 9-11 attacks. We responded by changing the way we live, to changing the way we fly, changing the way we travel, the way we think about safety. We invaded Iraq, we invaded Afghanistan. We spent several trillion dollars. We've lost however many thousand, uh, you know, spilt a lot of blood and treasure. Our overreaction makes you wonder who the enemy really is, whether we are not our own worst enemy, uh, by overreacting, you know, rather than taking terror and understanding it for, for the... For the size and shape that it is, which is that it's a terrible thing, but it's not something to, you know, go crazy over. Um, now, ISIS, going back to ISIS and terror, I ISIS has always told Muslims, you should come in to our territory. And only if you cannot come to our territory should you engage in acts of lone, lone wolf attacks, the kinds of attacks that we saw in San Bernardino, for instance. The only case in which they actually used terror 
as deliberately out of their territory to attack the West was the Paris attacks in November of last year. That was the only instance. And I suspect, and this is my own theory and it's speculation, which is that as they lose territory, as they lose military battles, and they have, you know, they've lost Ramadi, they've lost Tikrit, they've lost Sinjar, they've lost a, num a lot of territory in Syria. As they lose those territories, they will seek to attack uh, through terror in the West because it garners attention and it tells their recruits that they're still relevant. So as they get more and more desperate militarily on the ground, they will, re they will use more and more terror attacks. And so I think we should see these terror attacks not as a sign of strength, but rather as a sign of weakness. What is the answer? Do you uh, advocate stepping up the bombing, stepping up the drone attacks, putting boots on the ground as many advocate, or carpet bombing, or, or just doing nothing? No, I think that we should pursue a, a policy of containment. I think we should be very clear-headed about what our core strategic interests are, make sure that those interests are not threatened or jeopardized by ISIS or by anybody, frankly. Uh, and, the, and I would include, in addition to the oil and all that, maritime shipping is super important um, in, in that part of the world because it, there are many strategic choke points, like the Hormuz Straits or Bab el in the, the Red Sea or the Suez Canal uh, in Egypt. So those, those are important nodes. We should contain ISIS. We should fight it uh, as we are doing with local forces and air, aerial campaign and special forces. And I think we should try to, in as much as we can, to get other people, especially other Muslims, to fight this ideology. And, and ultimately, to understand that the solution to ISIS is going to be a generational effort, largely led by people in the Middle East, to reform their own societies. Because th that's what's generating this, this kind of violence and this kind of terror. Now, uh, a caliphate uh, needs land, needs to have a state. Islamic State needs to have a state. To have a state, you need land. And right. they seem to evince an appetite for more and more land. That's right. Is it, uh, they do say that they want to fly the flag of ISIS over the White House, uh, but uh, do they want more land only in Muslim countries or do they, are they seeking world domination or what is the ultimate goal? I mean, according to their theory, it's world domination. Okay, so the, the caliphate is a unitary imperial Islamic state. It has no territorial boundaries. It's constantly engaged in wars of conquest to conquer territory. For them, the only Islamic land is the land that they control. So the land of Saudi Arabia or the land of um, Libya or wherever, Egypt, if it's not under their control, it's not considered Islamic land. It's land that needs to be conquered, but they wish to go beyond that. So that would include Indonesia, say, and the Philippines. Yes. The, I mean, ultimately, the whole world, they want to retake Iberia. I mean, they want to retake Spain because that was once under Islamic rule, but they want to go beyond that. Now, this is all talk. You know, this is part of their kind of fantasy world. Uh, which they use for recruitment. They also talk at times about apocalyptic ideas, that, for instance, that they are um, a sign, you know, their existence, their, their battles are a warning of the end times. Um, end uh, of the world. That's right, of the end of the world. But I think they play with the apocalyptic idea very carefully, largely to recruit people, but not really, I don't think they, they believe in, that it's going to happen now. This is not an apocalyptic cult because it's building a state. They, you know, they have videos about their, uh, about their, you know, um, roadworks, about fixing sewers, about you know, uh, gardens that they're planting and parks that they're build, that they're that they're fixing. I mean, a state that was apocalyptic would not be doing that, those kinds of things. How do you see all this playing out? Do you think they're just going to die out of their own accord? Are they their own worst enemy, or uh, are we going to uh, step up military action against them? I I think that the Islamic State, like most Islamist political movements, it being the most extreme form of one, do not have, does not have the answer to the modern day problems of Muslims and of people in general. They cannot produce jobs, they cannot run economies, they cannot run you know, proper functioning states, they cannot provide for the goods and services that are now expected of pe by people throughout the world, but, it, but also in the Islamic world. And uh, eventually, these ideologies will be seen to be failures. This is also, by the way, true about Iran. Um, Iran is an Islamic state. 
Iran is like the caliphate. I mean, it's not that different from ISIS in, in, the sen- in some of the claims that it makes about itself. Um, in Iran, if you had free and fair elections tomorrow, I think two-thirds of the population would vote against this regime and would want to have nothing to do with religion in terms of r- how to run a government or run a state. They would want religion to be a private matter and the way we think about it here, for instance. Um, because they've seen what a religious polity is like, and they've seen that it doesn't deliver the goods. It just cannot live up to the promises that it makes. So I have a question for you, Professor Haeckel. Uh, what, in your view, is to be done about ISIS? I think we should contain them. Contain I mean, them. I think we should contain them. So I'm we should think we've of run out of time, but contain them is a marvelous answer. So thank you so much thank for you. coming by. I enjoyed you. it immensely. And Thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more conversations in the digital age. I'm Jim Zirin, and all the best.